Sun your shades. Wet or dry. Clay or clean soil. These are exposed to or protected from wind. Um, utility lines. It's either exposed to DIC salt or not. You're either in the city or rural heat. And then there's something called the uh, urban heat index, which is um, how much the city heats up and holds on to its heat, where in, conversely in rural areas um, there's not much that heats up that holds on to the heat at night. So you're liable to be five to ten degrees warmer in the city than you are out um, in the rural areas. And that's the, um, that affects the trees. Let's talk about some sugar maples. Um, that's where their native range is. And here's a whole bunch of varieties. So um, you can pick onto a variety that you like in sugar maple. You can go straight sugar maple or you may find that you want one that has the heavier, thicker leaf, which you might go legacy, or something that's fast growing, and you might pick a, a different one that's fast growing. But here's some choices. Um, arrowhead is narrow. Bonfire, um, it's a uh, great fall foliage, fast growing. Commemoration, commemoration, um, Again, vigorous grower, uh, endowment narrow, Fairview, fast grower, uh, fall fiesta, um, leathery leaves, better in dry conditions. So fall fiesta um, is more fit for uh, urban conditions. Not right on the street, mind you, but off the street a ways. Um, green Mountain, um, deep, uh, deep green, thicker leaf, that's important. Legacy, their leaf is, a, is an inch and hour, one and a half times thicker um, with a waxy coat um, than the normal sugar maple. So this is a great one for drought resistance. And that's where we're headed with sugar maples, it's drought resistance. So I plant a lot of legacy. Um, Seneca cheap, again, narrow. Sugar cone. Um, I have one in my yard, it grows two inches a year. That isn't, that isn't gonna get anywhere in a, in a hurry. Um, but it sure is pretty when it cuts loose in the, in the fall. Bone the only thing in the winter. Um, some problems that sugar maples have, um, the maple bore. You can see the diagonal line across the sugar maple. It takes two years um, to go through a life cycle. So in two years, it can you know cut across the the um, the bark into the xylem and phloem um, four to six feet. Nasty little bugger. Um, Verticillium wilt is um, comes from the ground. Uh, soil borne fungus uh, gets into the maples. Um, usually when the site is wet or you have a wet a wet time of the year, persistently wet. This could be a bad year for Verticillia wilt, which doesn't dry out pretty quick. Um, we talked about salt and what salt does to sugar maples. Here's a good example of leaf scorch. And the salt gets out on the end of the, uh, the leaves and uh, it just dries them right up. That will recover though, right? next year the following year but it mind you that that leaf isn't producing sugar at this point right so your your energy and i talk about energy levels in trees when a tree goes through the winter its energy level is low you know so it's about here and then it consumes an awful lot of energy to produce um leaves and start to grow so its energy actually goes down and then in the summer, it stops growing after six weeks, four to six weeks, it stops growing, puts buds on, and then from that point on, say the middle of June, July, through July, August, into September, it builds up energy again. 
and that's the most energy it's going to have. So if it loses the capability of making sugars, photosynthesizing, somewhere in the summer, then its energy level isn't going to be as high as it could be. And it uses that energy to hold off and ward off insect infestation and disease and decay. A tree, when it's injured, will set up boundaries behind the injury, towards the center of the tree, above and below the injury, and more importantly, on the sides. So the tree will grow around its injury. It's not like us, but we cut ourselves and then all of a sudden we come back and we have uh, a nice smooth uh, wound recovery. Trees grow around it. You see it growing around its injuries and bury it. If those barriers are strong, especially the one behind it, and above and below it, it will hold that injury and that decay into one space and hold it in the tree. If it's a, a tree that holds up good boundaries, has good energy, then it stays that way. If it's a tree that doesn't make good boundaries or doesn't have good energy, then the decay is liable to go into the center of the tree. You see hollows in trees because the boundaries have failed. But the outside boundaries are holding and the tree is growing around that decay. So this is not building energy, not producing the, um, the energy to fight decay. Yes? Uh, is the salt damage from the absorbing the salts in the roots or from salt spray getting It can be both. I see. It can be both because this will take salts up um, from the ground. I think um, we did a, a study on, on College Hill Road at Hamilton College where we found out that um, the salts were um, four times greater next to the road within the first six to eight feet of the road than they were 20 feet away. And that salt gets in and that causes the problems. So it's getting aerosol as cars go by and a spray and then it's it can, getting it can, on You can get um, salt through the air. Yeah. If you go down if you go down the throughway and you take a look close look at the trees on the side of the throughway, you'll see that they got short stubby branches. Yeah. They're like like this instead of like this. And that's from the spray. I see. The takeaway though is the maples just aren't gonna tolerate salt. So you gotta get the maples that are that are on the side of the road that are out in the country are on a slow fade. Those in the city they've already passed. They are about to pass or should have been taken down because they're ready to come down. Um, red maples. Red maples. You can grow red maples pretty close to the ocean, and that's where I I, I, I get my barometer as to what you can plant in a salt situation and what you can't. If you can grow it down on Cape Cod, you know, be it a little bit warmer down there, but on the ocean, then you're gonna take salt situation in central New York. So down there, you know, Red Oaks, Lindens, London Plains, um, Coosa Dogwoods, Elms, just to name a few, um, sit there in salt spray, North Maple, sit there in salt spray and they have no problems at all with this. But red maples will tolerate some uh, salt. Um, swamp maples, so that they, they need a wetter site, but they have great fall foliage. And the fall foliage can start as early as the first week of September, and it can end the first week of November. So depending on how you plant your normal, your, your red maples, you can take foliage from September to November. Um, Each the plant grows fast, great fall foliage, many different species, salt tolerant, hardy. That's what we're looking for. Okay, here's some growing right beside the road. 
Autumn Flame. Autumn Radiance is on the college campus. I don't know where that one is, but that's pretty close to the road. But you, these are all the trees that you can grow fairly close to the road, but not under cover lines. Generally speaking, power lines are on one side of the road or the other. So one side of the road is going to get short, stubby trees with some sort of ornamental value. And the other side of the road is where you're going to be able to plant something that is tolerant to salt and will give you um, a lot of diversity. And diversity is the point. When we had elms making the canopy going down every street in the northeast, the Dutch elm trees came in and killed all those elm trees. They came back west of Rochester and put in ash. Hmm. East of Rochester, they put in Norway maples. Norway maples has now been labeled in the face of species because its seedlings overtake the natural um, population in the areas uh, around where they, they are and you get a, end up with um, just Norway maples and west of Rochester where you got the ash all of a sudden an insect came in from China called the emerald ash borer and since 2002 to now it's in 28 states and essentially six billion ash tree are going to die in the next two decades. And for those dealing with utility lines, taking the ash tree down, I think NIMO had, they said 600,000 ash trees within distance of their primaries. So an ash trees, when they die, the branches fall off in the first year and they're likely to succumb under their own weight in two years. So they will fall over. So they have to be taken care of. In any event, diversity. We can't sit there and put one species of tree in our urban areas and say, that's okay, that works. It has to be a maple, then it's an oak, then it's a London plane, then it's something else. But you gotta diversify. Cucumber magnolia seems to be doing pretty well in the spring result. Can I ask a question? Far away. Um, someone told me that we plant way more male trees than we do females, which is why we have a problem with pollen. Is that the case? Sexist. <laughs> <laughs> what about the, uh, I hadn't heard that one, have you? You know, I, I think that um, a lot of times the sexes are on the same tree. When it comes to ginkgos, if you're not planting a male, you're making a big mistake. Because ginkgo is, and I'll get there, it was a fossil. They thought in North America, the, the last fossil evidence was five million years ago. In Europe, and they found it growing in a monastery in China. And um, so they went and collected the seeds and spread it across the world again. The fruit smells like rotten meat. There's fossil evidence of ginkgo 250 million years ago. And for a fourth grade class, I went and looked at the dinosaurs 250 million years ago, and I put this, the picture side by side. The fossil with the ginkgo leaf and the dinosaurs. And that's why it smells so good. Dinosaurs would come up, it smells like meat, they like it, they eat it, they distribute it, they deposit it with fertilizer, and off it goes. But to, but to have a female ginkgo now on your property is no bonus. So that's why they plant males. But for maples and I didn't believe it, but I just, I don't know enough to say no. Thank you.
just a comment while we've got the fig trees up there. You'll notice the form of the trees and the maple trees are a little different there. Uh, if you don't write down the cultivar, uh, unless you've got a good memory, somebody may come up and says, what is that? Or one died. You planted four of them, one dies. <clears throat> and you put another one up there, it's not going to look the same. So for that, uh, We're facing that problem on, on the parkway where uh, we had um, an energized um, uh, councilman plant a tree for every soldier that passed away in wars from Utica. So he has quite a few trees that he's lining up the parkway. Uh -huh. The thing is, he didn't use the same species all around. So now that some of them are dying, you have to try to go back and figure out which one he planted to be able to replace it so that the line looks somewhat consistent instead of 15 trees of one variety and one of some other different variety. There, so, good there, point. There, oh, uh, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, there are very few, like, like Terry said, there are very few trees which are basically have the opposite sexes, but some of those trees why we plant one variety or the other is because of more of a seed issue or more of a separate issue, it's not a pollen issue. Usually there's a separate issue that's why we're planting more of one than the other. And it's usually a seed issue or a mess issue, especially in urban areas where you have those species issues. That's why, like you're saying with the ginkgo, and there's a, there's a few others out there that are similar. You don't plant the you know, either the male or the female because of the specific issue. But I'll have more of it. Um, October Glory. Um, this is the this is the tree that will um, hold its foliage in the first part of November. Um, a great tree. Um, just as long as it doesn't have a wet snow that comes in. But those trees are 20 years old and they're doing quite well. Um, a couple of others. And you can see that the degree of, of the fall color changes, not just the picture and different, you know, cameras or different films, but they are different in so many different ways. Reds, red oranges, yellow oranges, yellow reds. Um, the hardiness, red sunsets good to zone three, but burgundy bell is zone five. So you got to know if you're in a cold pocket or not. <coughs> Because cold air comes down the hill um, and then sits in the low area because the, the air is heavier, denser. And that's why it's colder in the city than it is on top of the hill. But it warms up more in the city and it's colder at the top of the hill in the spring. Um, red point, brandy wine, a couple more. Again, different, just different reds. Carpet, very narrow tree. So if you have a narrow site between the sidewalk and the building, you can put a 30 foot tree there, but it's, it's not very wide. Um, Armstrong. When they cross the red maple, which is the swamp maple, with Silver maple, which is a fast growing um, dry site maple. They got a tree that can go, be planted wet or dry, and have a variety of different colors, and not be as brittle as the silver maple is. If you deal with silver maples that are big at all, they're brittle, they throw their branches under the stress of ice or snow. Um, but they grow so fast. So this, this variety, um, the Fremoni hybrids, are really good. Um, and again, um, fast growing is, is exactly what they are. Maples have a little insect problem, and I call it little because it, it, it 
it's very unsightly, but it's not all over the tree. It's on a few of the leaves. Um, and again, it's, it, all, all the leaf isn't um, not functioning. It's part of it. They have uh, insect cases, um, spindle bladder mites. Um, just unsightly. If it's too, if it's too thick of a population, the tree will shock the leaf. Um, does not involve um, a, a, a spray of uh, pesticides. Sometimes if they you put an oil out and you can take care of it or something early in the spring, and it's a waste of your time and money. Um, thornless honey locusts. And I, and I emphasize thornless. We have a straight honey locust. We had, uh, had a straight honey locust on the Hamilton campus. <laughs> and they put out um, a thorn that was six foot long. And off that six foot long thorn, there were side thorns. Um, and these were big and thick, and they were nasty. And uh, it's something that we have to do every year was to clean the thorns up above where they would get uh, involved with students. So thornless honey locust is a, is a much better tree, um, a good urban tree. Um, they're taking the salt on the parkway. Uh, <clears throat> problem with them is that they get to be a little sticky and they, they throw down a lot of sticks. So they're not clean compared to other trees. Dirty, 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 dirty tree. But you need diversity. You gotta put stuff out there that's gonna live. Because if you put something out there that's gonna die all at once, you're making a big mistake because you're wasting all those years that you're trying to plant something in and then it doesn't make it. Uh, street Keeper is a nice tree. It's narrow, it's tall, good shade, good green, good fall color. And again, I, I, I guess that all honey locusts um, shade, shade themselves to the point where they kill the in, inside branches and they die and drop off. <coughs> They're a mess. But they live yeah. and they take the salt. Um, there's one white birch that I know of that does not die from bronze birch borer. Um, that's white spire. And that's why you're not seeing a lot of white birch planted um, all the while. When I was growing up as a kid and all these um, these rural areas were turning into uh, housing developments where 50 to 60 houses would go in, every tree, every, every, every other house had a white birch. But the white birch was under stress. And a white birch under stress is like ringing the dinner bell, the bronze birch boar. So when the bronze birch boar went into these neighborhoods and they just had to jump from house to house to house through these communities, all these, all these white birch were dying. This one right here, um, white spire, it's an Asian birch, um, makes it. What we were planting instead is the river birch. Again, it has exfoliating bark. Uh, it's a pinkish uh, brown bark. Um, the dura uh, is, is a little bit smaller and, exhort, and it takes more heat than the heritage, which takes um, uh, has more resistance than the straight river birch. Does not get bronze birch borer, or is very resistant to it. Zone three hardy, um, but it's a wet site tree. Um, and it's good for uh, water gardens um, where you direct all the water into a certain area and you have a very gravelly soil in there with collection pipes at the bottom of it so all the water is collected there but you want, don't want it to be ugly and river birch will live in that situation. And it's used a lot that way. <coughs> Cordain Cherry. Um, I don't know of a problem with the Cornelian cherry. It's not a cherry, it's a dogwood. Um, it's the first, it's the first plant to come out and bloom. Um, mine's been blooming for two weeks in my house. It's 
20 by 20 doesn't grow too strong, doesn't have insect or disease pests, it has an edible fruit in the middle of the summer. Um, and by the time you have to go clean up, all the critters have taken the berries and eaten them. You don't have to deal with the fruit. It's, it's a perfect plant. Except that if you plant it on the sidewalk, you're liable to have some fruit on the sidewalk, and that's keep it away from the sidewalks. Um, flowering dogwoods. Um, I like flowering dogwoods. They were the most popular small tree in America for a long time and native to uh, the Appalachians. They're an understory tree, so they grow in dappled uh, sunlight and shade, partial shade. <clears throat> the problem is that they get a disease called anthracnose, um, which kills the branches and it has a borer which uh, girdles the tree by eating the trunk and the uh, xylemic foam underneath the trunk um, the heart, and uh, it kills the tree so when you have a situation like that you cross it with the kusa dogwood and we've seen the kusa dogwood um, in flower as a tree that we can plant right on the, the edge of the roadways because it takes us all. Um, does have a, a fleshy red berry, um, which is messy on the sidewalks. So maybe you want to keep it a little bit farther away from the sidewalks. Um, but it does fruit like that. It is edible. And uh, you'll have a lot of um, four-legged critters coming around eating the seeds. But it's pretty and the fall color is um, bright red. So you cross that Coosa dogwood with the, with the American dogwood corn in Florida, um, as uh, Dr. Orton did down at Rutgers, and you end up with the Rutgers hybrid dogwoods. And these are not to be taken lightly. Big flowers with a tree, got some pink, got some white, got a couple different habits of growth. Um, they're great trees. Fall color works very well. And Mike, that's how you get out of trouble with. Um, Admissions. You put yeah. the fall color on their on their admissions building, and they, they think you walk on water. Um, another good uh, street tree um, is the uh, Japanese tree lilac. Does not get too tall, um, maybe up to 20 feet. That one's been growing for 29 years, so it's way below the the wires. Um, it's an every other year bloomer because it blooms so hard when it does bloom that um, and produces seed that it takes a year to recoup and put a flower pot back on to grow the second year. Um, it doesn't have the the bore problem that lilacs have, the powdery mildew problem that that uh, lilacs have. Um, it's just a very good tree. Does it send out the suckers that lilacs do? No, it doesn't. But what you will get is uh, saplings growing uh, in amongst your bed. I transplanted four um, two to three foot saplings um, from the, the shrubbery bed that was right over here and created an area um, in the back that are gonna have these. Uh, Kusa dog that was right next to that. I found a kusa sap, sapling in there, and I moved that too. The, so it doesn't it doesn't spread by um, underground um, rhizome um, like the lilacs do. Um, certainly not like black locust, um, but it, it does have viable seeds and can spread that way. Um, white ash. Again, this is, this is how they were planted. Um, around parking lots, quick grower took, took the heat, took the salt, 
Um, and I guarantee if that's in the West, every one of them's cut down. And the cities that were planted like this, where they had these monocultures going, we're looking at bills in the vicinity of, you know, one and a half, two million dollars to, to cut the trees down. And that's in nobody's budget. So they had to bond to get the trees to take down, and then they had to come back and replant because then all of a sudden the cities got hot. And when you don't have trees in a city and it gets hot, you have a, your, your, your tempers get short. Your stormwater systems are now the wrong size because no water is being sequestered by the trees. And you have all sorts of problems. And there it is, Emerald Ash Board. It doesn't look so bad. But it's going to kill six billion ash trees. And it just reached our area, right? You found it on the railroad tracks? Um, that was uh, down near uh, the lot. Lot 20? Lot 20. Okay, I found it in New Hartford. So it, it's, it's a very low population now, and it's building. So. And what, it, how it goes, it, it takes a while to build up the, the extreme level, and, but when that happens, then they'll all die within a couple of years. I got a friend out in Lafayette um, on Route 20, uh, has 20 acres. You know, I told him about this. He, he took his ash out, um, the big ones out, and harvested them. He told me that every ash on his 20 acres is now standing dead that was left. And that's the way it is as you're going west. So if you take a drive west down the throughway, so as you hit Syracuse, you're gonna see all these pockets of dead ash everywhere. Rochester, Buffalo, up into Canada, across Canada. They're all dead. There are people who are starting to use the uh, damaged wood for crafts and woodworking. So they won't have a, they have an endless supply. Yep. Everything will find a market. Now the, the thing about ash is that wet or dry, it burns in the winter. So if you run out of fire, well, you can cut down an ash tree and, and split it up and throw it off, start a fire. It will start, it will burn. So wet or dry, it burns. It's a great firewood. They say, well, is there a natural predator to emerald ash borer? And there is. There's a couple of wasps that will kill it. But that wasp can't fly down the highway at 70 miles an hour like, like a quart of fire, firewood can. And that's how it's spread. It's in uh, what, 28 states, 29 states now. And it's only been 17 years that's been in the country. Flying. Speech. Um, nuts are good for wildlife um, but it's prone to beach scale willy aphid and, uh, and the beach park disease you can beach there is the european beaches european beaches where you find all the diversity in the um in the genus and uh you got the, the red one the red leaf ones you have the growth some are narrow Light colored, weeping. Magnolias. Um, magnolias are again um, one of those dappled sunlight trees that grow on the edge of the woods, but uh, they have a good flower in the spring. And uh, if you don't absolutely kill them with salt spray and salt, they will live fairly close to the streets. Um, so there's two, the Saucer and Star. You also have Dr. Merrill, which is across, and the Cucumber Magnolia, which is this one right out front here. Um, I think we had one on the hand when the college campus was over six foot in diameter, but it was hollow. There was only an inch and a half of wood on the outside of it all the way around. So it eventually had to come down. Sweet Bay Magnolia. Um, 
cucumber magnolia, uh, which is uh, a cumulatum, uh, crossed with some of these other smaller magnolias from the south, has given us uh, the yellow magnolias. Um, and, they, and they only grow to about 20 feet. So they have the size of what they were crossed with, but they get the yellow flower from the cucumber magnolia. And uh, some of them are very pretty and they all get a lot of money. Oaks, um, got a sad story growing here. Red oaks, um, red and blue, there's two groups in oaks, red oaks and the white oaks, great group. The red oak groups um, get uh, something called uh, oak wilts, and that will kill a red oak in three to five weeks, and it spreads um, even through grafted roots underground. So when you find one of these in a the pocket now, they're taking down all the oaks within the root system, and then they're cutting a trench around so that no roots are getting out of that containment area. That's how they take care of that now. But in the red oak group, um, you have the scarlet oak and the pin oak. In the white oak group, you got the white oak, the swamp white oak, the fir oak, the English oak, the shingle oak, the pigment oak. We have issues. Oak will. Um, sudden oak death is caused by um, Phytophthora. If you see this, you can get um, some phosphorus into um, the trunk and it will stop it. Um, not forever, but it will stop the existing condition and the tree can go on. Colorado spruce, uh, it absolutely slays me when every evergreen is a pine tree. If you walk away with anything, please, a pine tree has needles on it in clusters of two, three, and five. If it doesn't have needles in clusters of two, three, and five, you're not dealing with a pine. You could be dealing with a spruce whose needle attaches with a scale. It does have a problem. Um, right now, spruce needle cast is taking the Colorado spruce, which dries in the arid um, Rockies. Um, and you know how dry it is on the east side of the Rockies. It's desert. The west side of the Rockies is where you're growing 400 foot uh, evergreens. And you get it here and you get it in the moisture. And all of a sudden this disease needle cast has popped up and it's killing all the Colorado spruce. Has another, another disease called Cytospora. You see the sap running down the inside of the spruce tree. Um, there's nothing you can do about it except take the stress off the tree. But here this is again on Hamilton College campus where uh, we were looking good in June. Um, in July, we're looking like this. August, the trees came down and were planted in the fall. The whole planting came down except for the one magnolia. Two needle pines, red pine, Austrian pines. Three, they're three to five inches long and look very similar. The Austrian pine buds are white, red pine buds are brown. Problem is the Floydian white. White pine is five needle pine. Scotch pine is a two needle pine. Mucal pine is a very short pine. Two needle pine. And there's the ploy of like. You've all seen it, you just don't know what to call it. Well, there it is. It lives uh, over winters on, on the pine cones. And um, the spores the fruiting bodies on the pine cones um, 
come out and then the spores shoot out onto the new growth and kill the new growth. And it usually kills from the bottom up because the water washes down onto the lower limbs from the pine cones that are above. So I will not plant the two needle pine, which uh, again is the Austrian pine and the red pine. Elms. We talked about elms and how they used to be from the canopies, um, the Genesee Street, all the way front to back. Elms interlocking, going down. They all died. And so what they did was <clears throat> they found the trees, the elm trees that were resistant to Dutch elm disease and flow necrosis. And they crossed them. Um, some with American and English, um, a lot of them with American and Asian, because the Asian um, elms are resistant to Dutch elm disease, form necrosis, and the elm leaf beetle doesn't like the taste of the leaf. So the accolade elm is one of those crosses done by the Morton Arboretum. Um, and it was Morton that, that started Arbor Day. And um, the Triumph Elm is the one we're planting now. It is an accolade crossed with another um, Chinese elm. And um, that one is fast growing, but doesn't have the sap sucker damage that we see on the accolade. New Horizon. Adrian, Pioneer, Vanguard. Some of these are American European crosses, some of them are American Asian crosses. Frontier, what a great little tree that is. Elm usually goes yellow, rusty yellow in the fall. Oh, this one starts flaming. This one's red, and it, and it holds it for a long time. Uh, Ali. Um, again, another Chinese elm, and uh, the salt, they could live in salt. And that's where Dutch elm disease was in 75, and that's where phloem necrosis was in 78. So, um, being resistant to Dutch elm disease and phloem necrosis um, is a good way to keep your elms around. Uh, there's a chart that, that I I made up when I was trying to figure out um, what I was going to try to get back into the Hamilton campus for its arboretum. And you can see that Dutch elm disease, phloem necrosis, resistance all the way through on those crosses. So that's where we went. Dutch elm disease is a fungus. It is, uh, lives underneath the bark and is spread by the elm bark beetle, either the European or the American. The European is smaller than the American. But if you burnt firewood for any length of time, you've got a piece of elm and you get these like starbursts where the eggs are laid in a line and they, the, they bore out. Um, and eventually they lead uh, up the xylem of the foam and the tree can't support itself. And it starts looking like that. Nice little necrosis. Ginkgos. It's a great tree. Don't get a, don't get a female. On Hamilton College campus, we had two female ginkgos. One on the center of campus by the health center, and the other one was on the president's lawn. The worst job was cleaning the ginkgos. Uh, sycamores. Um, the sycamore um, crossed with uh, an Asian sycamore um, gives you London Plain and. London Plain has two fruits on one stem, whereas the sycamore has one, 
they pretty much look the same as far as bark texture. Um, it might be that the sycamore head is, is whiter and that the London plane holds on to its bark a little bit more, so it's more model bark. Um, you can plant them right in salt, there's no problem with that. Um, but they do have um, a, a leaf disease called anthracnose. Um, so in a wet spring like this, um, you're liable not to see a full leaf on a sycamore until July, until it reduced out about the first leaf, you're gonna die because of the, uh, the anthracnose. But the London Plain is a little bit more resistant to um, anthracnose than the straight sycamore. But they're good urban trees, and they take remarkable abuse I don't know how many times you have to get sick in order to that. Uh, cow repair. Um, when I first saw cow, cow repairs, I thought we should have them on every entrance to the college campus. Then we got a, a ice storm and all the branches split off of them because their, their branch trunk unit was so tight that any pressure and they split right off. So then there was a whole lot of, I don't want to put a pair around. And they worked on it and they uh, got something called Cleveland Select, which has uh, more right angle of the branch to trunk attachment. So it doesn't snap as much in ice and snow. And then the problem is um, they think that they're invasive, close to being invasive because um, in the south coming up the uh, east side of the Appalachians, they're seeing full stands of cattle repair. And so um, that's a problem that way. And the other one is that uh, as soon as the, uh, the managers, city managers saw that they were a beautiful uh, flowering tree in the spring, and, and they are, and um, had nice fall foliage, which they do, um, but you're finding them being planted uh, almost exclusively again in the cities. And these monocultures are, um, are being set up to have another problem like the ash, like the elms. And so they need to be more, more diversely spread out. Um, and again, spread out the right one because there's a lot of varieties that aren't the right one. That's what I'm trying to sell you. But there's some good, there's so many trees out there that you can use, you don't have to use a pair at all. Uh, see, cherries. Um, cherries have a pit, okay, they're called stone fruit, uh, peach plum. Um, cherries, stone fruit. They have a disease on the bark called black knot. You can see it. Um, these trees are, uh, we're up uh, by, by lows. Um, and you can see that the black knot gets all over the tree and the, and the vascular systems are disrupted. It leads to death of branches, dropping of limbs. Um, not good at all. And we don't even need insects or diseases to have problems with trees. Um, we have people that don't know how to prune because this prune should be right back here. This is just a candy cane waiting for decay to come in and go right into the tree. Someone didn't bother to come behind their contract and pull their cables. So that one's about to fall off. And there's a bunch of research behind this one.